Good morning. We want to welcome you to our service for Exeter Bible Fellowship here in Exeter. We trust that you've had a great week and we look forward to our time together with you in God's Word this morning. I'd like for you to take your Bibles and, and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Last Sunday, if you remember, was Easter Sunday. And we shared with you some of the vital, some of the vital truths about uh, the resurrection, and vital truths that are important to us as believers because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've decided to make this into a small series of, of four parts uh, that I believe we, we should have before us during these difficult days that we're living in. And so today I want to share with you the question that Jesus asked two of his disciples in his third post-resurrection appearance on what we know as Easter Sunday. We know that he appeared to uh, uh, Mary and to other women at the tomb, and now today we're going to look at his appearance to two of his disciples on the way to Emmaus. I'm going to ask the question and try to answer it. It's a question Jesus asked the disciples. The question is, why are you troubled? Next week, I want to look at another question that the Lord Jesus Christ asked. And this also is a, is a question that uh, uh, is, is asked actually a week after Easter, the following Sunday. And it's a question that he specifically asked the disciples, and the question is, why are you troubled? And then in our last message in this series, I want to consider uh, another appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ several days later by the Sea of Galilee when he's speaking to seven of the disciples and specifically to Peter when he asked the question, do you love me? So basically, we're going to be looking today at the question, why are you troubled? Next week, why do doubts arise in your hearts? And then the final message in this series, do you love me? I believe that we've all heard these questions asked and answered before, but I think that they're very significant in the day in which we live. A lot of people are troubled. With all of the circumstances that we're facing around the world and, and right here in Canada, many people are troubled. In fact, I know that though many people are troubled, there are some people that are also have great doubts as a result of what's going on in the world today. And so Jesus asked the question, why do doubts arise in your hearts? I believe that we can answer that question next week as we look together at, at basically how doubt and faith often go together surrounding the same circumstances. So we'll look at that. And then, of course, the greatest question of all that we need to answer. When the Lord Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And that will be our final message in the series. Probably most of you have heard me say on more than one occasion if there's one day in history, one place in the world that I would love to have been a part of, it would be the, the, the place that we're looking at today in this message in Luke chapter 24. Two disciples had left 
sometime after early resurrection morning. We don't know the time. The Bible doesn't give us a time. But they tell us that they left Jerusalem and they were going back to Emmaus. Emmaus is where they lived. And so as we look at this and consider this, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, it's about 11.1 kilometers. If you would read in the scriptures, it tells us how, how far it was in, in the measurements of that day. But basically, it works out to 11.1 kilometers or approximately seven miles that they were traveling. And so as they were walking, we're going to find out some great things that happened that day. And as I say, this is a day in history that if I could choose one day to go back to and to sort of eavesdrop or walk along uh, with those disciples, this is the day I would love to have to see and to hear Jesus talk and speak and teach from the scriptures, the Old Testament, God's word. He was teaching the things concerning himself. And so I want us to look at that together this morning. And so by way of introduction to our message before we read the scriptures, you know, we're, we're familiar with the events that surround the, the week that we know as the Passion Week or Passion Ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ can be divided into several parts most people would say, well, there's first of all what we know as the pre-incarnate, pre-incarnate ministry of Christ. And this would be the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ from eternity past until the time of the incarnation. From eternity past until God became man. That's what we celebrated just a few months ago at Christmas. The incarnation. God with us. One of his names, Emmanuel. Following the pre-incarnation, we have the, the, uh, the, the pre-incarnation ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we have the, the private ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ when, when he was a child just growing up. From his birth until the Bible tells us he was about 30 years old. We don't know a whole lot about that part of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know quite a bit about his, his pre-incarnate life and ministry from, from the time that he created the world till his birth. But for 30 years, we know very little. We know that he was born in Bethlehem. We know that, that shortly after his birth, he and his family uh, had, to be, uh, had to flee to, to Egypt. And then finally, they were returned to to uh, Israel and to Nazareth, where, they, where Jesus lived. We know that when he was 12 years old, that, that his family, it was their, their custom, went to Jerusalem for, for the feast days for Israel. And that's when the Lord Jesus Christ himself at 12 years old astounded the, the, uh, the uh, priests and, and, and uh, uh, the Levites, uh, Levites, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, as he questioned them there in the temple. And then we know very little until he was 30 years old. And at the age of 30, this is when he began his public ministry. We know that he was baptized. We know that, that he began to call his first disciples. We know the uh, other events about the Lord Jesus during, during those early days of his public ministry. But his public ministry is divided into three different years. It's the year of obscurity where he's hardly known, he's beginning to do some of his miracles and beginning to identify himself to the world as the promised Messiah and Savior. Then we have the year of popularity, which was about a year and a half in length. And this is where he, he spent most of his time in Galilee and performed great miracles, the miracle of, of healing of, uh, so many people and, 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 and all. And then the final year was his year of opposition. And ending that year of opposition, we have what is known as the Passion Ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that Passion Ministry basically was eight days in length. From Sunday, that we call Palm Sunday, through Sunday, that we know as Resurrection Sunday, or the very first Easter. And as we, we look at the events of that day, 
the very first Sunday was, was what is called by many people the day of demonstration. Palm Sunday. On this day, Jesus officially offered himself as the king of the Jews. The following day was Monday. And on Monday, we call that the day of authority, where he showed his authority over creation. He cursed the fig tree. He cleansed the temple. He showed his authority over the over over the, uh, uh, the temple and, and the religious world of that day. The following day was Tuesday, and that's often called the day of conflict because Jesus is in conflict with the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and even a lawyer. And so there's conflict throughout that day as there's challenges one to another. The following day, Wednesday, is called the day of silence. And it's a day of silence because we have no specific recorded events uh, of the Lord Jesus on that particular day. Following that was Thursday, the day of preparation. It was on this day that preparation was made for the Passover meal. Jesus prepared his disciples for his death. And then we go to Friday. Friday is the day of suffering. This day is the fullest of the days of his passion ministry. He's betrayed early in the morning. He's arrested. Uh, Peter denies him. He faces trials before the, the Jewish religious leaders and before the Roman political leaders. We have on that day his last, last words on the cross as he's suffering and bearing our sin there on Calvary's tree. Saturday's called the day of absence. Because he's in the tomb, he's in the grave. And during that time, again, there are some recorded events that take place. But he's really absent from this world. And then Sunday, the day of victory, the resurrection. Jesus is raised from the dead. And he makes his first appearances to his disciples, proving that indeed he was raised from the dead that very day. So let's get a little background to, to this day, uh, uh, to this event that we want to look at that's recorded in Luke chapter 24. In the very first verses of Luke chapter 24, the first 12 verses, you find out it was the first day of the week and very early in the morning, according to verse 1, uh, certain uh, uh, women had come to the, to the tomb and they were bringing spices because they did not have time on, on Friday to prepare the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and then Saturday was in the tomb, and, and that was the Sabbath day for the Jews, so they could, could do no work or do nothing. And so it was on this first day, early, early in the morning, that they go to finish the, uh, Jesus' body for preparing and of course, some of the Gospels tell us that they were questioning, uh, what are we going to do? There's this big stone. How are we going to get in? But when they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And they went into the tomb, but they did not find his body. And they were afraid because it says two men in shining garments. These were, were probably angelic beings that, that appeared to them. And and. The, the, these beings ask, why are you seeking the living among the dead? They were saying, he's not here. He is risen. He told you he was going to do this. He has done it. And so we find out that they go through and, and uh, immediately they respond. They go and tell the other disciples. And of course then the disciples have many questions and they're not sure exactly what to do. As we look through this and consider these events, we find out that, that as the various Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record some of the responses. Peter's response and, and, and the other, some of the other disciples, they, they didn't really believe the women. And so Peter ran and, and he stooped down and he looked in and, Sure enough, there was no body there. And they were not sure, even though they had been told, and Jesus had taught them that he would die and that he'd have to be raised again. They did not fully understand this yet. And so we read in the Gospel of Mark, 
And Mark's the only gospel writer other than Luke that, that records this particular event. But Mark says this. He says, after that, he, Jesus, appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest. But they did not believe them either. And so according to, to the gospel of, of Luke, we have now the details about these two disciples that had left and as they walked and went into the country. I believe we find out who those two disciples are and I believe we find out where they're going and I believe that we find out what happened as they walked that 11.1 kilometers from Jerusalem to their home in Emmaus. I believe that Emmaus was the home of a disciple, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ by the name of Clophus and his wife, Mary, who was one of the Marys that was at the tomb. And they were related to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his mother, Mary. And so we could call him, call them Uncle Clophus and his and Aunt Mary. And as these two walked along, we begin to see some of the great, great things that the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, was showing and teaching to them. And so I would like to read now from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 down through verse 32. And I've called this the road to Emmaus. Listen as I read. Now behold... Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of them, whose name was Clophus, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that is spoken, all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter to his, into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as they sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? I'm going to stop reading there because this really is the record of the road to Emmaus. This is the, the next appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection. 
Jesus appears to these two disciples. Again, not everyone agrees, but I believe that they were Cleophas, Clovis and his wife, Mary. And they were going back to their home, disappointed, sad, and grieving because of their expectations that had been dashed when he was crucified. And now they didn't know where he really was. So as we look at this, I'd like to go through it very carefully with you, but quickly. The first thing we see is the reunion with Jesus in verses 13 through 16. On their walk home from Jerusalem, these two disciples were joined by the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were discussing as they were walking along all that had happened. And as they were going along, it says the two of them, and it was on the same day, so it was resurrection morning, they were traveling to a village called Emmaus. It was about seven miles or 11.1 kilometers away. And they talked together about the things that had happened. They were talking about that whole previous week probably, the passion ministry and, and all the conflict that had gone on to the point of the Lord Jesus being taken, arrested, and then condemned to death. They reasoned about all that had happened. And this word reasoning, they, they basically were, were examining it together. They, they were discussing it. They were, they were trying to, to grasp what had really happened. And so we find that really they were still in the dark. And so the Lord Jesus Christ comes along and Jesus makes a request of them. We have the request of Jesus. And so Jesus asked the disciples, well, what kind of discussion is this? What are you talking about? You're walking? You're sad? What, what's this all about? Why are you so sad? And of course, we have then the reply of these two disciples. Cleophas tells them the problem. He says, are you a stranger here in Jerusalem? You're the only one in all of Jerusalem that doesn't know what's going on and what's happened? Are you not aware of what's been going on in Jerusalem over the past few days? We had hoped that this Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, was the Messiah. He was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. He could do almost anything before God. And all the people witnessed and saw it. We had hoped that he was the promised Messiah. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem, to deliver Israel. But that's not what happened. <laughs> Instead of him delivering Israel, Israel delivered him to death. The chief priests, the rulers, condemned him to death and had him crucified. And then Cleophas goes ahead and says to them, and, and they're puzzled as, as he says to Jesus in, as, in his puzzlement. He said, and, and on top of all that, some of, some of the women got to the tomb this morning and, and they were astonished because he wasn't there. They said they'd seen a vision of angels and the angels had told them that, that he had been raised from the dead. And others went and verified that he was not there, that he was gone. But nobody saw him yet. And so Jesus then rebukes the disciples. He speaks to these two disciples and he says, Oh, you slow of heart to believe all the prophets had spoken. You see, everything that had happened had been spoken by the prophets in the Old Testament. They should have understood this. The religious leaders should have understood this. But they didn't. And when they look into, into it, we find out that Jesus, Jesus just rebukes them. Very strong words. Because he himself 
had taught them the very things the prophets had taught. They had taught him and or taught them, and he had taught them and shown them uh, from the scriptures, from their scriptures, the Old Testament. Everything that had happened, the things he had done, had proved that Jesus was the Messiah. He reminds them that that they had been told that Christ had to suffer these things in order to enter into his glory. He revealed to them all the things concerning himself, beginning at Moses and to all the prophets. This word revealed means to unfold the meaning of what was said by these prophets. And so he started with Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, and began to to show them what, what Moses had said about the Christ. And then he went to the prophets and, and told them. And I'd like to just very quickly go through and, and tell you some of the things that Jesus might have said to them. Now, I've written these down so we can understand, but remember when Jesus was with them? He told them, and, and, and John records it in John chapter 5, verse 39. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He said, look at the scriptures. This is God's word. It's inspired. It's infallible. It's in Everything God says is going to happen as God said. And so as you look at the scriptures, as Jesus now, and, and can you imagine, I don't know how, whether their pace slowed down as Jesus began to teach them, but I can tell you, the Lord Jesus began to expose to them the great, wonderful truths that we find in the Old Testament about the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he probably started in the book of Genesis, what we know as the book of Genesis today. And he would, he would told them, you know, this Christ, he was the creator of the world. In the beginning, God, you see. And the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry here on earth was declared to be the creator. He was God. He was the seed of the woman. He was God incarnate. He was, we find out in Genesis, he was Noah's ark of safety. He was Abraham's ram. He was, as you go through, uh, everything that Moses had told them in Genesis. In Exodus, he was the Passover lamb. He was the one who, who came to redeem and to deliver through his blood. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. He was the offering for our sin, as recorded in the five offerings. He was the only one that could give peace with God and enable us to worship the true and living God. In Numbers, he's the guide. He was the pillar of cloud by night and a fire by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is the true judge and deliverer of his people. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. And we could go on through each book of the Bible like that. But, but later on, when you get down to the, to the book of Esther, he's the preserver of his people. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's the only one who can satisfy. Or drop a little further in Isaiah. He is the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. In Lamentations, he's the prophet who weeps over his people. In Daniel, he was the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's the mighty one to save. In Zephaniah, he's the Lord who is mighty to save. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness who brings healing in his wings. And every other book in the Old Testament and every book in the New Testament would tell us who the Lord Jesus is. But he expounded to his disciples that day on that walk those things 
about himself. Can you imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus open the scriptures and say, look, it's me. It's, it's me. It's all about me. I'm the one who, who, who came in order to redeem you, in order to be that Prince of Peace, in order that you might know the way, the truth, and the life. The Lord Jesus Christ. And then we find out that by this time it was getting late in the afternoon. They had arrived at their home, and Jesus pretended that he was going to go a little further. But they said, no, no, it's late. Come on in. Spend, spend, the, spend the night with us. Have a good meal. And so the Lord Jesus stops. And they go in. And then we find the recognition of Jesus by the disciples. And how did they recognize him? Their eyes had, had been, in a sense, sealed, so they couldn't, didn't recognize him, even though probably there was a, a family relationship there. And certainly they were disciples, followers. They would have seen and known him. But their eyes were, were, were so that they could not recognize him. But there at that meal, what did the Lord Jesus do? He took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And their eyes were opened. And all of a sudden, he disappeared from their sight. You know, their eyes being opened is just a reminder to each one of us. Even though now we can't gather together and now uh, I'm standing here preaching to, a, to a, uh, an auditorium of empty seats. But hopefully someday soon we'll be able to meet together again. And as we meet, we're going to be able to meet around a table where in remembrance of him, when he broke the bread and when he took the cup, he gave thanks and he declared, these are symbols of who I am and what I have done. And so we have the road to Emmaus. What a miracle has he vanished from their sight. And so what did the disciples, those two disciples do? They said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? Now I want to tell you, through what we've been going through over the last four years, through chemo and the other circumstances, I know what heartburn is all, all about. But I want to tell you, this was a different kind of heartburn. This is a kind of heartburn that each one of us should, should desire because as they heard him talking with them on the road, he opened the scriptures to them. Their heart burned within them. The excitement, the anticipation, the revelation that they were receiving. And I'd like to suggest to you this morning that every time we open God's word, our heart should burn with a passion and a love for God and for His precious Word. And so that moves us then to the next thing. We had the road to Emmaus. Now we have the road from Emmaus. Here are these dear disciples. Walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And as soon as Jesus vanishes out of their, their sight, what do they do? They head from Emmaus back to Jerusalem. They had now a passion and understanding. Their hearts were gripped and they had to go and tell their fellow disciples. And so we read as we start in verse, 34, uh, verse 33. It says, So, they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem 
and found the eleven of those who were with them gathered together. And when they got to Jerusalem, what did they do? They said, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said those things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Now that's our question this morning. Why are we troubled? No matter what's going on around us, what our circumstances are, as difficult and strange as the days and, and, and things we're experiencing today, our hearts shouldn't be troubled. Jesus reminded his disciples previous in his public ministry, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. And of course, we'll talk about this man, Thomas, later on. Thomas says, how can we know the way? And how, how do we know? And, and Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. And so... We find out that he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why do doubts arise in your hearts? And again, so many, so many believers, so many Christians are experiencing troubled hearts and doubts and wondering, what's this all about? I can tell you, the Lord Jesus is saying, listen, don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Trust me. We have a God who is trustworthy. And you want to know something? No matter what the outcome is, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's far better. To be absent the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We have nothing to fear. We as believers can't lose. We're on the winning side. You see? And so, we shouldn't be troubled. We shouldn't doubt. We need to trust our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the Lord Jesus speaks to them. And after he had said these words to them and, and told them, he showed them his hands, he showed them, he says, he, he, he said to them, uh, uh, you know, uh, look, it's, it's me. See where the nails have gone. And, and he explained to them. But it says, while they still, not, but did, while they still did not believe, for joy, and the marveled, he said to them, Got any food? <laughs> the Lord Jesus says, Let's get on with life. Let's don't let these things destroy us and, and, and keep us from being and doing what we're supposed to be and supposed to do. And so he says, Just realize and trust me through all of this. Jesus then gives a responsibility. The last part of the chapter, and we didn't get there in our reading this morning, but the last part of the chapel says this, don't be troubled, but go with the message. Go into the world, preaching the gospel, making disciples, letting them know that we live in a day where there's hope. We have to go with that message. So let's move on quickly here. We see the appearance to the disciples, but the conclusion. Remember, the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. So what is the heart of the matter this morning? The heart of the matter, if you look, and I don't know if you noticed, but the number of times that as we read this passage of Scripture, it spoke about the heart. It talked about the disciples being slow of heart. I wonder today if part of our problem, one of the reasons that we as believers are struggling 
with all that's going on around us, with this pandemic that, that we're experiencing, I'm wondering, is it because we're slow of heart? God has given us his word. God has told us in a word who he is and that he can be trusted. He's never failed us. They were slow of heart to believe. How about us? Are we slow of heart to believe all that the scriptures say? I also question. Notice that the disciples had heartburn. When they really began to let the scriptures speak to them as Jesus opened the scriptures and exposed himself to them, we know that basically their heart was set afire. A new passion, a new desire, a new drive to live for him and to serve him. Notice also the disciples not only had a slow heart, they had heartburn, but they also had a troubled heart. Even later on, though they, they had grasped the truth, he, he's alive, yet their hearts were still troubled. Let your heart not be troubled. Trust him. Is your heart troubled? God's word has a solution. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, God said, don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What would happen if we as believers seriously began to pray during this crisis? Would we be surprised? And, wow, look what God's doing. Or would we be saying, thank you, God. We knew you. We could trust you. What is it? The gospel. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to tell you this whole season that we've been in, this Easter season, it's all about the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Don't doubt. Believe. There's only one way of salvation, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have sinned. The Lord Jesus Christ died to pay the debt for your sin. And he conquered death. And he met the demands of a holy, righteous, just God. And that was evidenced by his resurrection. And so, I ask you, why are you troubled? Why are you troubled? We need not be troubled as believers. Has Jesus opened your eyes as he did to those disciples on the road to Emmaus? Has he opened the scriptures as you read the scriptures? Have you allowed him to speak to you by his spirit through his word? I think for most of us, he hasn't opened the scriptures to us because we haven't opened the scriptures to read them and to really meditate on them and to see what he's saying to us. And so we ask, has he opened our understanding? Has Jesus opened the scriptures? Opened your eyes? Opened your understanding? Again, during these days, I want to encourage you. Our hope is not in this world. It's not in this life. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ. A great message, the gospel message, is a message that we need to hear today. Do you know him whom to know is life eternal? Because if you have, it all started with an open grave last Sunday. And then an open home where these two disciples opened their home to him. Where their eyes were opened. Because the scriptures had been opened. And then their understanding was opened. And I want to tell you at the end of this chapter we find out that heaven is opened. As he ascends back to heaven. 
And we also find out that we are to have our mouths opened. We are to go with this one great message. And what's that message again in closing? It's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen. He's alive. He's not dead. He is alive. Let's pray. Father, for your word, we give you thanks. Your word is living and powerful. It's that word that Jesus opened to his disciples because the word is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. From the first words in Genesis, in the beginning, God, to the last words in the book of Revelation. It's all about the person and the work of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, what a blessing and privilege to know Him and to live in the day in which we're living, this very day, to have the privilege of making Him known in this world. We give you thanks now. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.